Hello and welcome to the WCEG Network. It is September 2nd, 2020. You are listening to the new WCEG Network on WCEGTalkRadio.com. If you're there, all you have to do is click the live stream tab and you can watch all of our lovely faces. You can watch us on Smart TV via YouTube by uh, typing in WCEG Network. My name is Norman A. Carter, Jr. I am your host, along with my co-moderator, Ms. Demita Chapman, and we'll be with you for the next 75 minutes or so with a very, very, very interesting program. We are the Worldwide Community Empowerment Group, where we speak life into the community. You can like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter and on Instagram at WCEG underscore talk underscore radio and also at WCEG network. A word of caution, the topics and opinions are those of the show host and our illustrious guest and not the opinions of the WCEG network. Thank you for your continued support. Thank you for listening. This program is going to be well worth your while to pay attention to. <laughs> and I'd like to first welcome my co-moderator, Miss Demita Chapman of the Leaders, oh, I'm sorry, of the Citizens for Excellence in Elected Leaders. Miss Chat Chapman, welcome. Hi, I wanna thank you guys for uh, attending this uh, important forum uh, getting your voices heard. Uh, uh, it's, it's, I'm excited. That's all I got to say. I'm excited. Uh, I'm going to go into the first three questions that was text over to me. And uh, this will go to each one of you guys. Uh, the first question is, given that this is only a month election, what can you do in that one month? And we can go with uh, we can go with uh, Representative uh, Abel Mabel first. I think she got to <laughs> unmute. How much time do we have to ask the question? Answer the question. The moderator. Okay, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Well, now I don't, I don't, first give an honor to God who's the leader of my life. It's an honor to be here. Um, but one thing I sort of want to push back against, if y'all will allow me to, is I um, am uh, very committed to not going into a runoff. And so I will try to give a something about three months, but I don't really believe that um, based upon the brand and the work that I've been doing in the community that the people won't not send me on the first round. But if I had to be in a one month situation, then what I would have to do is to, is to uh, work closer with the members of the Georgia delegation uh, to make sure there are specific things that they've already been working on that I could assist them with. And also what I'd be able to do is to get information out to the members of the fifth district so they could actually watch what's going on uh, during that time that I'm there, as well as I would try to put in place a, a Zoom situation where people from the district can time in and uh, see what's going on that time. I'll be able to vote on legislation dealing with um, the care package, which is what people are needing. Uh, people need to uh, the unemployment extension. Uh, they need to have their uh, the male the male working they never have. Uh, they need to uh, make sure we deal with issues around our veterans and our small business funding, as well as issues they have legislation in place uh, dealing with that. And so what I'd be able to do is to vote positive and affirmative. But if uh, we had a little bit more time, I actually would try to uh, work with some members of the Congress to be able to get uh, some initial legislation put in. Thank you. 
Okay, uh, Mr. Muhammad. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Well, I'm seeking the office of Congress of the Fifth District as an independent. Some of the issues that concern me are criminal justice reform, how we can make it better for those who have been on the other side of the law to be re-entry re back into society, to stop destructive gentrification. Gentrification has hit this city very, very, the fifth district very hard. All over, prices have skyrocketed from uh, 100,000 to a million dollars for homes. That's an issue that I really, really want to deal with uh, to ensure that we have true and affordable housing. Also job training, entrepreneurship, opportunities for real public engagement. These things I feel are important for us to have in the fifth district. Now, I think starting one of the hosts, the gentleman said when we started that this radio station speaks life into people. And that's what we want to do. We want to speak life into the community. We want to make sure that the community is lively, that people come back to life because right now, in America, the death angel is moving through all over through the pandemic. Economically, there's death. We want life to come back to the fifth district. And the way that we do that is we bring light. Light is life, it's power, it's energy. So we're gonna bring light to all of these dark subjects that are going on, police brutality, mob attacks. We wanna deal with that. We wanna make sure that our citizens, if they wanna protest, they can protest. We wanna make sure that if People would like to uh, have something in life to start a uh, business, go in, into the business area, that loans are available through them, through the banks and those sort of things. So we want to make sure that life comes back to the Atlanta community. So we want to create a new reality. That's what we'd like to do. Thank you. Mr. Franklin. My name is Robert Franklin and I'm running to serve as your next congressperson. It's important to understand that there are two elections happening this fall that will affect the seat of Congressman John Lewis. Our special election happens Tuesday, September 29th. That person who wins, if there's not a runoff, which pushes us to December 1st, then has an opportunity to carry on the legacy of John Lewis. And then the November 3rd general election that State Senator Nikema Williams is in. There's a lot of confusion about the two elections and we need to care about this September 29 election with early voting starting in, on September 8th next week because these are the final, I call them sacred days of Congressman John Lewis. You have an obligation to care about the final days of John Lewis's term. What can we realistically do? And I have to say as a former president of two anchor institutions in the fifth district, as a 30 year resident of the fifth district, I believe that you can hit the ground running and ready to focus on the Voting Rights Act now has already been passed by the House, H.R. 4, named in honor of John Lewis. It is sitting in the Senate and they are on vacation. What a shame that people are suffering and dying and the Senate is resting and playing golf. Secondly, in addition to protecting voting rights, I wanna focus on flattening the COVID curve. Over 5,000 Georgians are dead tonight because our governor's inept leadership and the White House and this corrupt GOP US Senate has denied the crisis and has delayed in mobilizing a clear- Thank you, Mr. Franklin. Agenda. Okay. So I look forward to serving you in that capacity. Thank you. We go to Mrs. Uh, Keisha Waits. Um, you Yes, ma'am. Thank you Thank so you. much. Yes, ma'am. Thank you for the opportunity to be with you tonight. Uh, so we're, we're having a conversation about what can we realistically accomplish in what I believe is 90 to three weeks. I think there's quite a bit we can accomplish. I think it's important to note that Congress is actually in session. Uh, and so in December, uh, will be there are two weeks. And so I think a couple of things are important. Uh, 
constituent services certainly are important. We have a number of healthcare workers, educators, uh, veterans uh, who are having challenges specific to COVID-19 given the pandemic and challenges with health. And so I think that the opportunity to, uh, to lobby uh, with respect to expanding uh, health coverage to millions of Americans is very, very important. Second thing I think is important is to elect a new president of the United States. Uh, the leader of the free world is necessary uh, in terms of all types of change, the US and globally. And so I think that to be in a position to uh, assist with helping to elect our next president and vice president will be critical. Uh, here in Georgia, we have huge numbers in terms of COVID-19 and certainly our struggling small business owners need our help. Those stimulus packages are before us right now. And so I believe that there's quite a bit right now, we are not represented in Congress. And so it is essential uh, that the next member hit the ground running. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Martin. Um, thank you for that question. And um, I wanna say, I. Thank everyone for joining us here this evening. Um, in three months span, I want to echo the same sentiments as Ms. Thomas as that I don't expect a runoff, but I think that it's important to reestablish the voice of the people and to re-empower the people. Um, essentially, I think that, and I know the people feel this as well, is that we're past due on progress. As a special needs educator, I've seen what poverty has done to the community. I've seen what an abundant nation like America in the lack of the healthcare resources that we possess and how that has been so detrimental to the people at large, how this has affected us now and how it will affect us in the future. So within the short amount of time that I will have in office, I will first hold Congress accountable for all the misdeeds and their lack of action they've taken in representing the American people well. The second thing that I will push for is universal basic health care, as well as universal guaranteed income due to the effects of the pandemic, as well as the ongoing issues that will appear later on in the future as well. And I also would like to um, re-emphasize the elderly care because um, oftentimes in this nation, any time of major crisis, we like to cut budgets to elder care. And I think that it's important that we not only look after the future of this nation, but look after those who have laid the groundwork for us to get to the point that we are here today. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Martin. Okay, now we'll go to uh, Chase Oliver. Hello, thank you for having me to speak uh, tonight. Uh, so the question was about what can we accomplish during this time uh, if we are elected? And my focus and my platform has been very much focused on criminal justice reform. And there's a bill that's actually uh, in the house right now. It has failed to get a committee hearing or any kind of strength behind it. Even though it is uh, endorsed and co-sponsored by Representative Ayanna Presley and other progressive Democrats, as well as Justin Amash and uh, even Republicans, it's literally a tripartisan bill but it hasn't gotten a vote on the floor. And this is a bill to end qualified immunity for law enforcement. This will allow police to be held more accountable in uh, civil court and will allow people to get the justice they seek. When you see uh, Jacob Blake last week shot by police seven times in the back, had his spine uh, severed, paralyzed from the waist down, you know, he's gonna wanna seek justice in the civil court. Qualified immunity is now a hurdle for him to seek that justice. And we need to end that. And we need to get that vote happening. And I believe in four months, uh, we can put the pressure on the House to get that vote passed and to put people on the record as to where they stand, whether they stand with the people, or whether they stand with a law enforcement system, which is shown to be systematically abusive, not only to the poor, but specifically to communities of color. And I think we need to address those issues. We need to fight for those issues. And that's something that can be done. In addition to that, I also support a 50 state voting rights act. I want to expand the voting rights act beyond just the South because there's voter disenfranchisement all over the country. And we need to make sure that everyone in this country who wants to vote can vote. Uh, with regards to COVID-19, uh, is that my time? Yeah, thank you. I'm, uh, Mr. Carter, I'm going to switch it back over to you. I got two okay. more questions. Let us switch it to you for a while. Oh, no pressure. No pressure at all. <laughs> <laughs> Good evening, everybody. I, I, I'd like to apologize that uh, we didn't really get into everyone's biography. Uh, I, I'm, I'm hoping that uh, the people who are listening now are people who listened before, but I, I just like to run through what I can real quickly because, Please, uh, thank you. because it's very important that the people know for whom they are voting. Absolutely. Uh, Mr. Chase Oliver. Mr. Chase Oliver is the chair of the Libertarian Party of Atlanta. 
is dedicated to fight for the criminal justice reform, as you heard, and expanding choice in our political process. Uh, he currently works in the shipping industry as a multinational line of service uh, with a multinational line of service and spent almost 15 years in the restaurant industry. Mr. Barrington Martin, he was born and raised here in the great city of Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, he's a proud member of Kappa Alpha Psi Fraternity Incorporated. He is a, quote, natural born leader, hardworking and ready to continue the great work according to, uh, occur which occurs in this district. Reverend Dr. Robert Franklin. He's the author of several books, including Crisis in the Village, Restoring Hope in the African-American Communities. He is an educational leader. I could go with a long list of his educational experience, but he is the former president of Morehouse College. And he has and also a, a very lengthy and illustrious uh, background, especially with uh, HCU um, institutions, HBCU institutions. Ms. Keisha Waits, another Atlanta resident. Uh, she uh, attended or Georgia State, Georgia Southern University, Atlanta Metropolitan College, and graduated with a degree in political science. In 2014, she completed Harvard University's John F. Kennedy School of Government program and uh, for senior executives in state and local government as a David Bonnet LB, LGBTQ Victory Institute Leadership Fellow. She is also a former representative in the Georgia House of Representatives from 2012 to 2017. Mr. Kwanzaa Hall. Mr. Kwanzaa Hall is an, a, uh, a former uh, city Council member of the Atlanta, Atlanta City Council. He was appointed in 2005. He is the he served as finance executive, transportation, public safety, utilities, and zoning, and community community okay. development. Mm -hmm. uh, I go on, Mr. Stephen uh, Muhammad. Mr. Muhammad, again, he hails from Chicago, Chateau. And uh, he moved here and went to Georgia, I believe, Georgia State University. Yes, GSU. Uh, he's a, been a resident and active in the Fourth Ward. He is a lecturer. He's lectured to many universities and institutions throughout uh, Metro Atlanta and throughout this country. He was also instrumental in the original Million Man March as an organizer and in a subsequent March honoring that the 20th anniversary in 2015. Miss Abel Mabel Thomas is the owner of the Greater Vine Opportunities Program. She has over 35 years of experience as a in government. She has been off and on since 1985, a state representative for her area in, uh, in Georgia. And, and state representative. That's really a quick encapsulization because we really want to get to these questions. Again, thank you. I hope that I wasn't too brief and I wasn't trying to be too cavalier with that, but we do have so much to get into in such a short time. My first question is, uh, and I'll direct this to, to, the, to everyone, and please try to get, keep your answers within a minute to a minute and a half so we can get uh, to as many questions as possible. Metro Atlanta is decades behind most major cities when it comes to public transportation. Personally, I know people in the hotel industry who could not obtain employment because of conflict between MARTA's operational hours and their work schedule. Uh, because uh, the, uh, the inner county access to public transportation affects employment, business locations, and when you consider air pollution, health care. A few years ago, $75 million was wasted on a highway study program initiative in Georgia. That would have been better spent on improving public transportation. Is this a concern of yours? Is it a concern of your constituency? And what are you prepared to do to bring better public transportation to the Metro Atlanta region? I start with Mr. Chase Oliver. 
So thank you very much for that question. And uh, it, I really like the, uh, the section where you mentioned how there was a lot of money wasted on studies that uh, happen and occur. And that's not just in the transportation realm. Government wastes a lot of money on useless studies and things that we don't really need when we could be investing in our communities. Uh, things like the failed war on drugs that spends $40 billion a year in law enforcement money, that could be better used to invest in public transportation. I know it would uh, make our communities better if we had a, a better running MARTA system or one that ran for later hours, as you said. Uh, you know, and one of the things that I would like to talk about is how Congress does these things. You see these bills, these transportation bills, uh, it basically becomes a free for all between the leadership of both parties as to who can get what. It all becomes about who's trading what for what vote. And what we really need is we really need honesty in our Congress. And while I would only be there for a short time period, um, I would hope that while I'm there, I am being an honest broker, coming to the table and not looking to just horse trade and, and trade influence for dollars. I would rather just vote up or down on bills. Uh, and a lot of these complicated transportation bills, you know, they have spending that has nothing to do with public transportation. So I would like to uh, honestly see more honesty in our government uh, when it comes to things like public transportation or really any kind of spending. Okay, thank, uh, you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hall. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Sorry, I got I dropped off the call earlier. Okay. Uh, and I couldn't couldn't get back on. But yes, yeah, so, you know, I grew up in Atlanta on the west side and we had to use MARTA. We had tokens that got us to our uh, school over at uh, Mays High School during high school. And I use I use it still today. So public transit is something that is integral to my life, but it also uh, is the only way that many citizens have a way to get around. As a council member, I worked very hard to ensure that we were recipients of Tiger grants. Those are the large grants that help to fund uh, transportation from the Department of, of Transportation at the federal level. And I would work very closely with them to ensure that we've got more money to build out the network that we truly should have had a long, long time ago, like Chicago has, like Washington DC has, like San Francisco and Oakland have. We are supposed to have a network that gets people in and out of the city to work and back home and two places uh, of interest that they want to go. So I'll be a strong advocate for it, even in the short period that I've been there. There's some dollars that we have on the table that we have not been able to draw down. Some of them linked to the Beltline, but others linked to just general MARTA money, money okay. that we need to desperately get people around town. So I'd be a strong okay. supporter and advocate. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Thomas. I'm sorry, you're, you're muted. Okay. There we go. Here we go. Okay. Transportation is important to me. And um, one of the things I want to talk about is um, putting the Beltline uh, transit component to it. Because originally when it was envisioned, it was envisioned with a transit component. So I would like to look at transportation as it relates to that. Also, uh, pedestrian safety, people don't really think about that as transportation because we really need to look at the fact that some of the streets, uh, some places in Atlanta, you don't have sidewalks. So people can't not even they have to walk in the street. Also, um, bike lanes. We want to make sure that we have uh, access to Greenbrier. Greenbrier has always been a, a mall that really did not have the type of transportation uh, access in terms of exits. Uh, I think that we also need to look at um, the airport, money for the airport, and then some level of uh, airport dealing with Clayton County because Clay, the airport is in Clayton County. And I do think there needs to be some discussions about Clayton County and Atlanta, how both could do some type of sharing of revenue. Uh, I think that uh, Martin needs, always needs help. And uh, it was mentioned about the Tiger Grants. I would think that we try to get some Tiger grants that don't deal with um, those buses that we got going down Auburn Avenue that don't go anywhere. So I think we need to really make good choices around transportation. Okay, but thank that you. would be a priority. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ms. Waits? Thank you for the question. Am I still distorted or should I take off the earpiece? No, you're fine. Okay, very quickly. So I, I think it's important to have a conversation surrounding what we've actually already done. Uh, we've echoed many times that we have a short period of time to make any effective changes while we're serving. 
Uh, Clayton County was without MARTA for several years. I had the pleasure of serving on the Clayton County delegation uh, to ensure that MARTA was returned to Clayton County. Uh, during my tenure in my three terms in the Georgia General Assembly, I actually served on the Transportation Committee to which I actually introduced a bill to bring high-speed rail to the state of Georgia. Uh, most of us already know the commute times here in Georgia are absolutely egregious. Many businesses and corporations have passed on us for years. And so this is an economic development issue as well as a home land security issue. And so certainly this would be something that I would be very interested in leading on. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Mr. Uh, Barrington Martin. Yes, sir. Thank you for that question. I think that it's time for us to look forward to modern solutions that are going to be bigger and better and totally revolutionize not only travel within the state, but also revolutionize the way we look at the environment and the detrimental effects the current um, transportation situation in Atlanta um, in Atlanta has had on the people of the city. So what I'm proposing is something that is going to do well economically as well as environmentally, which is um, allow Atlanta to be one of the first epicenters of a high-speed rail line that will start within the city of Atlanta and partner with many of the airlines that um, are within Hartsville, Jackson Airport. And what will happen or what we will see happen is that um, we will see cleaner air, we will see the use of cleaner energy, and we will allow uh, the many different people of the city as well as outer parts of the state to be able to access um, these rail lines, which will allow them to travel um, many different places in a short amount of time in an economical fashion. Okay, uh, Dr. Franklin. It's so important that we focus on the issue of transportation because it has to do with mobility, how people move, how people connect to other opportunities and communities uh, that they care about. Uh, but I would see that as really kind of a metaphor for the important work that John Lewis did in Congress in helping to introduce the nation to the assets of the fifth district. And in the brief period of time that we have, I think that it would be important to message, to gather the exciting ideas we've already heard, but to even do more in terms of reimagining livable communities, walkable communities, communities that utilize public transportation, but also promote more sustainable forms of getting about. Ultimately, the next congressperson has to be a person who can speak truth to power, clean up the waste, use the appropriate resources to fund important initiatives like this. Thank you, Dr. Franklin. Uh, Mr. Bahamut. Yeah. <clears throat> As a person that uh, grew up riding public transportation in Chicago, I know how public transportation works when it works properly. It works, it runs 24 hours a day, seven days a week. In New York, you have bums and billionaires riding the subway. Here in Atlanta, the stigma that came from the outlying counties in the early days when MARTA was being placed on the table, they put a stigma on it that criminals would be able to come out to Cobb County, Gwinnett County, uh, Clayton County and all these other places. But now that we've become a more unified and cohesive fifth district or metro area, we need public transportation. Public transportation will allow those who are of uh, a certain income level to be able to get to their job. It would allow others of a certain income level to mitigate the traffic, be able to get down to the city from their suburban areas cheaply, save on gas, keep air pollution down. But it was stigmatized so bad in the early days from the rednecks and racists in the state capital and around the state of Georgia that people just don't want to do it. So now we have to rechange and recreate the image of MARTA or any of those other public transportation so that they know that it's really for the good, environmentally, culturally, socially, and economically for the metro area. Uh, Mr. Mohammed, when you talked about rednecks, were you uh, talking about me? Uh, Just kidding. Are you a redneck? <laughs> I was asking, are you a redneck? But if you're a redneck, then I, then I guess it, you have to wear that shoe. But to me, you seem like the person that's trying to impart light. And if you try to impart light, you don't fall into that category. So we you. want you to keep doing what you're doing in your beautiful way, because you have a beautiful spirit. I can feel you through the camera, really. Okay. Your spirit is beautiful. I heard it in Thank the you. first opening remarks. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to f flow into one other question. Uh, 
a lot of uh, folks talking about uh, nationally police reform. Number one, I'd like to know from all of you, and I'll try to get this through this as quickly as possible. Number one, are you knowledgeable about what goes on, what goes into police training? Number one. And number two, do you support defunding police departments? And what does that mean to you, defunding? And we'll start with Mr. Kwanzaa Hall. I think he's muted or distorted. Okay, maybe we'll come back to him. Miss Waits. Okay, am I, am I live? There you go. Okay, terrific. So one, thank you for this question. Uh, it certainly, this is a major issue nationwide. Uh, I think the word defunding is confusing to a lot of people. I think the issue is reallocating funding. And, and certainly that is something that I support. Uh, right here in Fulton County, there are organizations uh, where we have reallocated funding. Uh, I think someone's not muted. No. Okay, we can still hear you over there. Okay. okay, thank you. I, I would prefer the mute. Uh, nonetheless, uh, so I think it's important that we utilize wraparound social services to deal with issues such as mental health, uh, to deal with issues in terms of poverty, which we all know there's a major issue here in Atlanta, given that we have affordable housing issues. Uh, secondly, again, I want to talk about what we have already done. Uh, having served on the Public Safety Committee, these are bills that came up often uh, in which we had the opportunity to vet. I want to secondly mention that the band of box legislation that came from the state of Georgia, uh, Representative Tyrone Brooks and I sponsored some legislation that year when Governor Dill actually signed this into executive order. So this is something that myself, as well as a number of legislators actually advocated for, including Representative Thomas. And so certainly we want to have a conversation surrounding what has already been done. And given that this is a major issue nationwide, it would certainly be on the forefront of my mind. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Dr. Franklin? Yes, once again, I think it is important to keep in uh, focus, uh, Brother Carter, that this is a brief term. Yes. And what this district, the 790,000 people in this district who currently have no voice and no vote as major questions are being considered, must utilize the platform of this seat as a national office to speak truth to power to bring people together to help heal and redeem the soul of the nation. So the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act has been introduced. It moved rather slowly, but it did move once introduced uh, earlier this year in June uh, following his tragic death. That bill is, has been uh, passed. It does many of the things that are critical to do. And I wanna enumerate them because of the time. But it sits again before the Senate that they need to move on these bills. I've learned so much about policing locally and nationally from many of my former students who serve. They say that you cannot change the culture without the community's wisdom and input. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, Mr. Oliver? Yes, thank you. So uh, you asked, you know, do we support defunding the police? Absolutely, I support defunding the police uh, in, with measures such as ending the drug war. Now, again, this is a short term, but you know, you're asking me how I feel, and I do feel that we spend $40 billion a year currently on the drug war that doesn't need to be spent. Uh, we over-militarize our police. We have a Pentagon to police pipeline of military industrial complex spending that we don't need to be having. We don't need tear gas and tanks rolling down the streets of the fifth district. Uh, another way that you can, uh, it, you know, fight for this is to end other victimless crimes. See, right now we have uh, too much policing because we have too many crimes in the books that aren't really crimes at all, where there is no real victim. Instead, what we can do is we can empower law enforcement to focus on crimes where there are victims, uh, violent crimes, sexual assault, rape, uh, theft, property destruction, these things where there's actually victims as opposed to victimless crimes like petty drug crimes, which only clog up our prisons and cost us, the taxpayer, uh, a lot of money. Uh, and Again, ending cash bail is another thing that I'm very in support of. That costs the taxpayer a lot of money to keep people in jail for petty crimes when those who are wealthy can just buy their way out uh, pre-trial. So these are steps that we can do to defund the police by actually removing government spending from the law enforcement sector. Okay. And instead, Thank you, focus otherwise. Thank you. Okay. 
Thank you. Mr. Martin? Yes, sir. Thank you for that question. I think that ultimately um, we first have to, to take the term defund the police and break that down. And what I mean by that is, of course, um, it sounds outrageous, but what we're really trying to say is to reallocate police funds and the police budget. That is, take some of those funds that militarizes police and give them vehicles and weapons that they don't need to serve the people. Um, Mr. Oliver uttered a lot of the sentiments I believe in, um, as well as um, ending qualified immunity. Um, we have to uh, take a look at the punitive measures that we, we often engage in as a society as well. Um, there should not be any type of jail time for victimless crimes. For example, when you look at it on a macro scale, 25% of the, of the world's incarcerated population is just here in the United States of America. So I think that we have to do a couple of things. We have to attack poverty because a lot of times the crime is linked to the poverty, but we have to um, better assess why uh, specific things are going on within our community, especially on a national level. So ultimately, I think that we have to um, re-advise the policing itself, and we have to re-advise the laws that often um, punish people, especially the black communities within the district. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Thomas. Well, I think that um, when you talk about defunding, I think it was a word to sort of shock people, to really get people to thinking about it. But obviously we got too much of a militarization of the police. And uh, even though they may have training initially, they don't have much training in de-escalation. So that means that once they get on the scene, everything they learn seems to go out the window. But one thing I wanted to say is that I'm, very, I'm, I'm a pretty good expert on the issue of the no-knock warrant, which is the issue of Breonna Taylor. But some of y'all may remember that in, um, that there was a 92-year-old grandmother named uh, Catherine Johnson who was shot by the police. That was really one of the first police misconduct. And we were able to get the um, Red Dog disband, $5 million to the family, uh, reenacted the, uh, the um, Citizen Review Board, uh, got DC3 three off the books where they could just stop you in an area, in a known area, and they say it's a known drug area, push you and lock you up. Um, and also three police got arrested. So I've been, I've been on the ground as it relates to uh, justice issues. I don't even call them criminal justice issues, but I've been on the ground and I will continue to do that at the, at the federal level. But I Thank wanna you. say something, a, a minute ago, one of our speakers used the words uh, bombs to billionaires. And I'm not, try, not really comfortable with people being called bombs. I mean, people are human beings that may be out on their luck. But to say somebody rides the train, whether they're a bum or a billionaire, I think that's inappropriate. Okay, thank you very may, much. May I get a rebuttal to that? Sure. Uh, yeah, okay. Sure. You know, bums to billionaires. There are some people that just are recalcitrant. They don't want to change. I'm on the front lines more than anybody that's running. To I, see what our I disagree. Do. Okay, I disagree. we won't, based we won't on argue. That, based on I my reform record, you I, as I said, I'm. I'm a chaplain with the Florida County Jail please. Department. Okay. So I know don't, what these don't people call do. People Some bombs. Just, they don't okay. want to. Do we're not, not call oh, people folks, bombs. It's disrespectful. We're it's not disrespectful. gonna get we're not gonna get anywhere arguing with each other back and yeah, forth. You stated your opinion, he yeah. stated his opinion. I think we should move on. Thank That's you. That's right. Yeah. Uh, Miss, Mr. Carter, excuse me, uh, Mr. Hall is back on. Sure. Mr. Hall? Mr. Hall, are you able to hear us? If not, we can move on. Okay, uh, Ms. Ms. Chapman, do you have uh, questions that you would like to present? Uh, yes, the next question that uh, someone sent over me, uh, if you lose this election, will you still be in the, uh, out serving the people or go back and hide until the next election? That's all, all, all the candidates. We can start with uh, Chase Oliver first. So uh, if I were to not win this election, I would naturally continue the political work that I've been doing. I am the chair of the Libertarian Party of Atlanta. Uh, I seek to be building up uh, our political party here in the city and the state. But I would also continue doing the work that I've, I've uh, been doing, which is speaking out for criminal justice reform um, and also doing things like volunteer work. I love to go out and clean our local parks. Uh, it's, you know, it's not glamorous work, but it's something that I like to do because the city does not clean our parks. So I like to go out there with friends and family and do that myself. Uh, but yeah, I will still continue to be politically active. And uh, 
if willing, if I'm able to get on the ballot in the future, I would love to run again uh, for some office if I were not to win this race. Uh, but it is hard for third party or independent candidates to get on a ballot here in Georgia. We have the worst ballot access laws in the country, and this prevents competition at the ballot box. Many times when you vote in November, you have one choice, Great. and we need more than that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mrs. Waite. Thank you for the question. Uh, I had the privilege of serving three terms in the Georgia General Assembly. Uh, during that time frame, uh, I had the opportunity to work on many pieces of legislation that were very dear and personal to me uh, that passed, and we'll get into that a little bit later. But I'm also a small business owner. For two decades, I provided affordable housing to uh, low income families right here in my community, in my neighborhood. Uh, I've spent the last 15 years traveling, uh, serving. Uh, for as a crisis manager on some of the largest disasters that many of you are familiar with. Katrina uh, spent a year and a half in Puerto Rico following Hurricane Maria, H1N1, the BP oil spill. So serving is something that I have done for several decades and, and certainly look forward to taking that legislative track record and that record of community service with us uh, if we are uh, have the opportunity to serve. And Thank you, Mr. Swayze. Uh, Representative Abel Mabel Thomas. Yeah, I think that um, where we at is that uh, I'm a person that is born and raised and live in the same house I was born and raised in. I have uh, what we call in, in the street boots on the ground, in touch with the people, people in touch with me. I have a district office where people come and see. So I always continue to uh, work in the community. Yet I am one of the most accomplished Democratic legislators in the state of Georgia. Uh, when I've uh, worked with many people that's on the call. And uh, one thing I just want to mention real quick is that uh, Black women die three to four times more than any other woman at, at race at childbirth. Uh, I was able to work with uh, legislators, doulas, reproductive justice persons, um, health care providers, House and Senate to be able to put $21 billion in the budget to make sure that, our, our, that we stop Georgia being the, the uh, what you call the first in the nation in terms of something negative, and also put money in place for Morehouse School of Medicine. So whether I'm in or out, I'm um, on the ground for the people. Uh, got the experience of um, the legislative process. Um, thank you, thank you, Mr. Thank you very much. Uh -huh. you. Uh, Mr. Muhammad. Yes. Okay. Uh, would I run for another office? Emphatically, no. If I don't win Congress, that's it but I should win. But anyway, let me go back to the previous question, which I did not get a chance to answer. When it comes to police uh, funding and training, I know what goes into it. I'm a chaplain with the Fulton County Sheriff's Department. I've been a chaplain with the city of Atlanta. I've been on the front line. I've written with the Red Dogs. I've written with, uh, with the Sheriff's Department making arrests. So I know what that's like. But what I wanna say is that the former sheriff now, he lost the last election, Ted Jackson. We were having a conversation one day and he was a FBI, he was one of the highest ranking FBI agents, black agents in the history of the FBI. And I said, we were talking and I said, well, you know, the FBI, I said, brother, you know, the FBI, I said, the number one enemy to black people has always been the FBI. That law enforcement agency has been totally against us. They've killed, maimed, lied, cheated on black people. And I said, you were part of that agency. What, you know, what is it like on this side? He said, when he went there, it was a really rough place. Then he worked in it. He said that he made a lot of reforms, that he changed the culture of the FBI. And I said, well, you changing the culture. He said, I said, what did it take? He said he put in a lot of work to do that, a lot of effort. He worked in the FBI office in Chicago before he came to Atlanta. So we discussed all these things. And I said, well, you know, policing needs to be changed. And he had some ideas and we discussed it, but do I believe in defunding since my time is going out? No, we need to refund them in a better way, but to defund, it'd be chaos in the street. And Thank everybody you. said that we defund Thank them you, and Mr. let Muhammad. people, it'd be chaos out there. Uh, it would be running Mr. Martin. crazy. Thank you, Mr. Muhammad. Mr. Martin. Yes, ma'am. Um, I'm gonna always be commanded to do the work that God has commanded of me and the work that was instilled in me as a young age. Um, I grew up under the tutelage of the great Reverend President, former President SCLC President Howard Creasy Jr. I grew up watching my family canvas with the great Reverend James Orange and as they um, 
supported many of the civil rights political leaders um, of their time. Um, none of my opponents can say this, and this is very important. I was here June 9th, standing in front of a Titan because I knew and I believe that the people deserve more and we're past doing progress within this nation. As a special needs educator, I've seen firsthand on a day-to-day -day basis what poverty has done to our people now and what it will, what it will excuse me, um, end up doing to the children of the future. And I always believe that my generation and especially the generation of children that I teach, we all deserve to inherit the nation um, the way we choose to inherit the nation. Um, let's talk about some, some um, current things because we often love to speak about experience on these types of panels. But when the rioters and the looters were downtown destroying Atlanta, I was there first thing in the morning to clean up. None of my other opponents can say that. Thank okay, you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Martin. We'll go to uh, Mr. Franklin. Mr. Chapman, at the appropriate yeah. time, I'd like to rebut the statement that was made. Thank you. I, Mr. Franklin. Yes, thank you. I've had a lifetime of community activism starting as a teenager in Chicago and then I continued here in the city of Atlanta as a student at Morehouse. Uh, I have devoted time to developing a vision and that's part of what we need from leadership is to develop a vision for a better life and a better community, communicate that vision and then convene people to help implement the vision. My first book on crisis in the village, we talked about restoring hope in African-American communities. In my current book on moral leadership, I'd like to talk about moral leadership on Capitol Hill. But if I don't get that chance, I'll certainly support whichever of my uh, distinguished colleagues is successful in the race and certainly supporting uh, a future Congresswoman, uh, Nakima Williams in her work. We have a commitment to a better vision and supporting great leadership. Thank you, Mr. Franklin. Uh, let's get to Mr. Hall. Is he is he on? Okay, uh, Mrs. Waite, you can go back and rebuttal that question real quick. Yes, ma'am, very quickly. Uh, there was a statement made with respect to uh, what others had done with respect to the protest that occurred here in Atlanta. Uh, not only was I a part of a cleanup crew, but I actually participated in some meaningful demonstrations. And so I think it's important tonight that we don't spend our time, you know, bickering against one another. I think each of us are well qualified and committed to public service. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to turn it back over to Mr. Carter. Uh, Okay, uh, the coronavirus relief and economic security known as the CARES Act was passed by Congress with overwhelming bipartisan support and signed into law by President Trump on March 27th. One of the first tasks of the reconvening Congress will be a new stimulus package for schools, child care, vaccines, and businesses. A portion of the last CARES legislation provided millions of dollars to airline companies, universities, and large companies which did not need it, while small business people suffered. What safeguards to prevent this type of waste do you propose? Ms. Waits? Thank you for the question. A couple of things. Uh, it's important to note that Congress is in session right now. And so these are conversations that each of us would have the opportunity to join in. A uh, couple of things. One, the, the resources to, that they're trying to allocate to an FBI building, certainly I would support that being stripped out. Uh, you and I both know that Ivy League colleges as well as huge big box corporations and business owners were bailed out. What I'm more interested in seeing is the struggling small business owners. As a small business owner, I intimately understand those challenges. And so I would like to see some of those funds be redirected first to those small business owners who were not a part of the first stimulus uh, package. Uh, a number of individuals right here in our own backyard did submit for funding and did not receive any. Uh, others who took advantage of the grant opportunities were individuals who were not 
necessarily in need. Uh, and certainly, uh, finally, the millions of uh, Americans who are without health care. I think this is an opportunity to uh, create some opportunities for individuals who will have challenges specific to COVID-19 who don't have health care. So I'd like to see uh, the pork stripped out of the bill. Uh, going forward. And I would also like to see more funding directed toward struggling small business owners, in addition to those municipalities uh, that are hurting, uh, given that the limited resources right now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Muhammad. Yes. Uh, would you repeat the question? Yes. This has to do with the, the CARES Act mm -hmm. and the fact that uh, during the last uh, issuance of funds, a portion of it was uh, of the millions of dollars that went to airlines, universities, and other large companies who did not need it while small business people suffered. What safeguards to prevent this type of waste do you propose? That, that question is pretty difficult because based on what these criterions that they put in, first you have to change the criterion to make it happen. And you made some other uh, uh, points on that statement about them coming back to Congress and other things. But you'd have to change the way the bill was written because it was written in favor of what they say is small business, but it's businesses that in the several of millions of dollars, but real small business, the corner store, the uh, gas station, those businesses did not really get the money that they deserve. So we'd have to go in and rewrite the bill. I don't know if it's enough time to do that, but that's what I would be pushing. Let's rewrite the bill that's fair to the small businessman, that, that, that they get an opportunity where they can get some of these PPP uh, funds. There are lots of small businesses that we all know that still haven't gotten any money. Correct. At least that I know. They haven't gotten a dime yet. Mm -hmm. So I know that this was written unjustly, just like most of the system in the United States. It's against the black man. It's racist. And we don't get a fair share. So until somebody goes up there that will tell the truth, that will deal with it the way it is, then we will never get a chance because everybody's mealy mouth, weak minded, won't say what needs to be said and tell it to the, per the people that's up there the way it is that we need freedom, justice and equality and an equal shake in America. Thank Man, you very Robert much. Brown, small business people, black people, uh, faith leaders and community leaders really need to be heard. So until that much. happens. Okay, Mr. Not Oliver. Well, I'm going to hop right on to the sentiment of unjust uh, spending and, and, and fragrant abuse and corporate abuse in our government. I mean, you got to ask yourself, how is it that there are these big uh, corporate giveaways in this bill to begin with when there are businesses who are shuttering in our neighborhoods? That is a that is a real question we need to ask ourselves. And the truth is, is because the political leadership in Washington, D.C. put that money in the bill because they're bought and paid for by those big corporate special right. interests. So what we need to be doing is we need to be giving direct money right back to the people. I, uh, I will line up right alongside my libertarian colleague in Congress, Justin Amash, that says if we're going to pass a bill, it shouldn't be things that include things like helicopters for the Pentagon and uh, money for these big corporate interests. It should just be money directly back to the people. Just give us our money back and we'll cut the budget next year to make up for it. But let's get the money back in the hands of the people right now who need it, who are suffering and who need that assistance. And that's what we can do. Cut the red tape cut all these programs out, just give the people their money back. It's a much simpler way to do things. And it's one that's going to give people the help that they need. But again, this system is corrupt and it's corrupted by the leadership in both parties who decided to put that corporate spending in. And we need to examine who did it and why and ask for alternatives, more choices and more voices in the ballot. That's what we need. Thank you very much. Mr. Kwanzaa Hall, are you with us? Yes, I am. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Yes, Hello. Sir. Okay, yes, sir. Great. yes. So I would support, you know, I had coronavirus back right after uh, mid July and, you know, it was a really tough situation, but I can imagine there's so many people who have no resource to deal with this and have children and, and are facing, you know, loss of job, loss of home eviction. So I'm, I'm a proponent of and my idea is to propose COVID innovation zones where different parts of our city and in our case in district five, with the CDC and all the health organizations, we innovate around contact tracing, around testing, around access to PPEs, around education solutions during the disruptions that tie to the digital uh, divide that we've had inherently for a long time, but it also gives us a chance to innovate around education. So COVID innovation zones, you know, take this crisis and let's take advantage of it like lemons into lemonade. And I think we could really come out of it really strong. District five could lead on that. 
and I'll be a proponent for ensuring that any of that pork that's going to the wrong places is redirected and realigned uh, specifically to get to people in need. Okay, thank you. Ms. Thomas? Um, Representative think, Thomas? Yes, I think that um, that what we're dealing with uh, is the fact that uh, we need to deal with the issue of healthcare, specifically how we saw people treated, seniors treated during this uh, pandemic, where they were basically left to die alone. So it has to be some reform around that. And so what we need to look at too is unemployment benefits being extended, um, making sure there are no a, a moratorium on evictions or homeowners as well as renters. And we also must make sure that our small businesses don't get left out because apparently when they talk about small business, they must be talking about, they say 100 and under, but the ones that we're really talking about is those that's maybe 20 and under. Uh, those persons that are um, what we would call salon owners, barbershops, um, folks who are doing consulting businesses and you working with our young people. So I think there's a lot of reform that can be done mm -hmm. uh, at that level. And I think that uh, it's gonna take somebody not just only to speak up, but has the connections to make it happen and will be what we call no well, small learning curve. And that's what I do believe that I bring to the table because I can be day, day one ready uh, to be able to make sure that the fifth district gets its fair share, whether it's in, in the budget process or even with the legislation that's being put before the Congress at this time. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Franklin? Yes, I think it's important to underscore what a leader can realistically do during a brief term. And it is helpful to know members of Congress, to know the culture of Congress, and to be and to know, of course, our district. That's one of the things I've had an opportunity to do over my years as president of two institutions, spending time with numerous members of Congress. It's leveraging those relationships to focus on issues like COVID. Two points. Senator Kamala Harris has introduced an exceedingly important measure to creating a task force to look at racial and ethnic disparities in the distribution of COVID monies. Her work needs to be seconded and trumpeted, and I would do that from the well of Congress. The other is everyone viewing tonight should be worried, very worried about what's happening over at CDC. I work on that campus on, at Emory University and next door, people, the morale is low, good people are leaving, good people have been fired. Our current US senators in, of Georgia have fought the expansion and funding of critical COVID and pandemic readiness teams. We have a lot of reconstruction to do and we need a leader who can leverage this platform to make it happen. Thank you very much, Dr. Franklin. Uh, in the interest of fairness, I really want to get back to uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Kwanzaa Hall. Sir, sir um, uh, is it possible to uh, do a rebuttal? Sure, go ahead. Statement? I haven't okay. answered your question yet. Um, okay, for, for no, okay, on, first on the, on the past question. Okay, well, let me go to Mr. B Mr. Martin uh, first. Okay. Um, I first want to. I would be remiss if I didn't um, include. I will include this in the chat for anyone that doesn't know that the executive order was um, issued as of yesterday per President Trump through the CDC that extends the moratorium on evictions through businesses as well as homes. And I would be remiss as well if I didn't mention our great Mayor Bottoms who also did this same notion through October 31st. I think that um, to answer your question that is that it's important to protect those that are subjugated and those that are um, least advantaged in throughout this um, coronavirus pandemic. This includes our healthcare workers. This includes the elderly. This is why I'm a big proponent of the people's bailout in which I'm promoting universal guaranteed income as well as universal basic healthcare services. Um, I think that those two ideologies are very important to be preventative measures to prevent the um, catastrophe that we've seen through the pandemic, but it also protects us in future issues and crises that we're seeing right now. Okay, thank you very much, sir. Uh, okay. I, and I will give you some time for a rebuttal, uh, Ms. Thomas, but in, in the interest of fairness, Mr. Kwanzaa Hall, are you still here with us? Yes, I am. Okay, I, I, there, there was a question you weren't able to answer for due to technical difficulties. 
So I would yeah. like, like to go back to that with you. Uh, police uh, reform appears to be a national concern. Number one, do you support the funding police departments? What does that mean? And are you knowledgeable about, about what goes on, what goes into police training? Yes. So I've, at my 12 years on city council, I led the um, repositioning of Atlanta police. Obviously, there's still a lot of work that needs to be done at the local level throughout our country and, of course, at the national level. I support the George Floyd uh, justice reform package. But, you know, the term defund turns off a lot of people. And I, I really get the idea, but the semantics uh, makes it a hard thing to pass in many communities around the country. So I think reimagining uh, public safety is really a, the type of term that we've got to put out there. And, and there's a group I've been working with looking at, you know, divestment, uh, repositioning of, of, um, of our police departments and protecting all of our citizens in the true way that they're supposed to. It's called DRIP. So there's some new ideas on the table on how you frame the conversation in a way that you get everyone at the table. But I'm an absolute mm -hmm. supporter in reimagining public safety and ensuring that our system that says it's just for everyone is truly just. And that's what I'm committed to. I've already done it as a council member, and I continue doing it as a congressperson. Okay. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, Ms. Thomas, uh, we'll give you like 45 seconds for rebuttal. Okay. What I want to say is that it was spoken that, you, that, uh, that somebody had a lot of relationships at the uh, Congress. I don't believe anyone has more relationships than me at the Congress level based upon the fact that most persons come from a state legislative body. Some come from city council or they come from um, the county commission. But I served as a member of the National Caucus of Black State Legislators. And many of the persons that used to be legislators, state legislators, went on to be Congress people. So I have a vast resource of persons in the members of the legislative uh, Black Caucus, as, other, as well as other members in the Georgia delegation I served with. Also, it was spoke about the whole issue of the CDC. And we do appreciate the CDC being in Atlanta, but we also want to raise up complementary medicine because we don't want to uh, be, because of the pandemic, we do have to look at the science and deal with the medical industry. But there is another industry called healthcare industry, which includes uh, those persons, chiropractors, that have improved acupuncturists, there are people who are nutritionists, and those persons have to be rolled into the equation of healthcare in America. Otherwise, we will find ourselves only dealing with medical doctors and not dealing with self-help, self-care, and complementary medicine. Thank okay, you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Chat Chatman, do you have any uh, questions? Uh, you're on mute. No, I don't. I think I asked all my questions that were sent oh. over. Uh, what okay. I will say, uh, and then I don't have to come back. I want to thank all of you guys for taking the opportunity to uh, tell your story, your views. But what I will say, and I need, you know, I, I say this to everybody. When you run in this race, take your personal feelings out of it and think about the people. It's not about, it's not about y'all. It's about the people. Right. And so uh, when, you, when you're doing this and uh, you got to September the 29th, take your personal feelings out and just think about the constituents and the people. Thank you. I turn it back over to uh, Mr. Carter. Thank you. I, I think we can go take, take this time to, to give everyone about two and a half minutes of final remarks. And I'll start with Mr. Muhammad. Thank you. Uh, I wanna say that I, I, I thank this group for allowing me to be on. And all of the people that I'm running against, uh, they've done a lot of things, they've done a lot of good things. But the things that we just, we just said is that it's the people. It's the people to count. It's not who you connected to or what you connected to. It's are you connected to the front lines of a people that are suffering, of people that are hurting, of people that need a new reality because their lives have been destroyed by this pandemic. Now, most of us here are eating on this panel. We're eating, so it's not a problem. But what about those who have not gotten a meal and that money was cut off by the uh, Congress, the Senate and the House, who did not give the money. What's going on in their lives right now? There are 13 million people who are no longer getting that money. 
and they're suffering tremendously. So I'd like to speak to their hurt and their pain and what they're going through. Most of us feel, most of you out there feel that Congress, the people that they are, are worth two cents. They're no good. That's what you really feel in your heart. Well, I'm saying that I would be some good because I would work for you. I'm one of you. I came from you. I came from your cry. I came from your pain. So I know your pain and I know what you feel. I haven't sat somewhere where I've been distant from you and you don't and I don't understand what you're going through. I've seen it on the front lines. So what we want to do is that we want to go to Congress and get rid of the gridlock so that your needs will be met. We want to go to Congress and get rid of the partisanship so your needs will be met. And the only way that will be done is that the person is nonpartisan, nonpolitical, and they're independent of any pressure from outside forces. Thank That's you. That's what you need. So thank, thank you. you, Muhammad. Vote for me to help create a new reality. Thank you. We move on to Dr. Franklin. You have two and a half minutes. Thank you. On September 29th, you, the voters, will have an opportunity to make a decision about who should complete the term of Congressman John Lewis. I regard these final weeks, these final days as his last days. They don't belong to us. They're not about us. They're about Congressman Lewis and his legacy of speaking truth to power, of serving the people of the fifth district. I'd like to hit the ground running, seeking justice for those who have been dispossessed during this critical period of COVID, seeking to empower our government to fight COVID in a comprehensive, thoughtful way, driven by data, and to put a full court press on this. I'd like to begin to heal the racial divide and the wounds by bringing people together, as I did as president of Morehouse College, as I did as president of the Regional Council of Churches. I'd like to ensure that fragile families are receiving the funding they need. As one of our colleagues just noted, these COVID stimulus checks are a moral obligation of a government that has no hesitation about collecting taxes. They should provide those funds. We have an opportunity to reinfuse hope into our communities where there's so much pain and so much despair. And that is my, has been my calling. I've written, I've projected a vision for providing hope to all people. I'd like to use that opportunity with relationships that we have to convene the right people, to make a difference immediately, to transform and reconstruct the fifth district. And so I ask you to look Thank at you. my website, franklinforcongress2020.com, join in, make a donation, get involved, and remember, Early voting starts next week, September 8th through September 25th. The last day to vote is September 29th. This is a special election, a special term. I think you need a specially crafted candidate. And I'd like thank to you, be sir. your candidate. Thank you, sir. Mr. Oliver. So thank you for having me at this forum. It's been a pleasure to speak to the voters. Uh, first and foremost, very quickly, if you want to check out my website, go to chaseforhouse.com. Uh, and you can donate from there or volunteer from there as well. But uh, I want to talk about what my platform is. My platform is about taking the voices. You know, 2020 has been a, a, a very unique year. You know, we've had a pandemic and we've had a criminal justice movement that's been happening in the streets, not just at the fifth district, but all over this country. And I want to take those voices into the halls of Washington, D.C. I want to take that righteous anger that we have towards an abusive police system and towards an abusive court system, a systemically racist court system. I want to take those voices to Washington, D.C. and serve the people by demanding an end to qualified immunity, demanding that we fight to end no-knock raids, and demanding that we pass a 50-state voting rights act so that people all over this country who want to vote have the right and the ability to do it. That is why I'm going there. I'm not going there to seek prestige or office. I'm going there to take the anger voice, the voice that we hear on the streets, to the people in Congress, the establishment who are so far removed from the streets, they haven't heard us this entire year, even with tear gas and police batons, but we're gonna make sure that they're heard once, I, once this race ends. I guarantee you that. So that is why I'm running in this race and that's why I hope to be your next Congressman. Let's take those voices to Washington DC and make the people be heard. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. Ms. Waits. 
Thank you so much. Uh, I want to begin my statement by indicating that I am a woman of faith. So I am guided by a specific set of principles that govern every single thing that I do. I don't believe that any of us will fill the shoes of Congressman Lewis. However, I do believe it is essential that the next member have that same spirit of servanthood. Uh, like many of you, I believe in the legacy of Congressman John Lewis. Uh, I am a trained crisis manager uh, and I've spent several decades serving. Uh, I consider it a privilege uh, and an honor to have the opportunity to complete the unexpired term, which is an interim term. I know that there's a lot of confusion surrounding that. I'm a three-term state legislator. I have experience passing bills across the aisle as well as working with individuals who I don't necessarily agree with. I think that that set of skills will be essential to being effective in Congress. And finally, I was born and raised in the fifth district. I'm a 47 year resident uh, of the district. And lastly, uh, I have served uh, members of Congress in 38 states, uh, having served with three federal agencies, being a congressional manager, uh, working with members of Congress, disseminating information following federal disasters. And so I ask for your vote on September 29th, as well as your prayers. My website is KeishaWaits.com, and I provided my cell information if anyone would like, like to reach out to me. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you very much. Ms. Thomas, you have two and a half minutes. Uh, first, I'd like to say, first, give an honor to God, who's the leader of my life. It's been an honor for me to have served as uh, in the Georgia General Assembly uh, 22 years, but three separate times. So I've not been going straight through. So other people have served in this seat as well. I served four years as city council person citywide. And uh, I'm on the ground as of right now. Like I say, the bill that I passed in the General Assembly was recent, June 26th. I was able to pass the bill to help black families and stop, uh, slow down black mothers dying at childbirth. So I'm the author of the first mandated benefit in the state of Georgia requires insurance companies to pay for mammograms, pap smear, the prostate cancer test. Also led the community response to the 90 year old grandmother that was killed by the police, police misconduct, three police went to jail. I feel I'm the most well-rounded candidate and, I, and I've been on the street giving out lunches of mass sanitation by weekly, I've been in the marches, uh, whether it was the march from the King Center down to the Capitol. I've been out there, so I'm what we call the well-rounded candidate. I am willing to take some of the issues that, that some of my uh, opponents or people who are in the race took Congress with me and so that some of their voices will be heard. I believe this is a legacy seat. You must have somebody with courage, conviction, and results. I have integrity. And what I know is that, especially in election to elect an experienced leader, with integrity results and tried and true leadership. There's no way around the fact that you can't go to Congress and just act like it's just any old place you can go. It takes a lot to be able to understand the process. I can understand the process, negotiate, construct legislation, pass legislation, amend legislation, and still be in earth in turn and then kept in step with the people. That's who I am. I'm well-rounded, Abel Mabel Thomas. If you really want leadership, you want somebody to do something in the three months you got, and bring somebody who already has done something in, in the years. Remember, I serve in a body that we only serve for 40 days. So, so 90 days is really double of what I know. So the bottom line is if it's 40 days, I can do the work I do. Surely in 90 days, I can make impact. Send Thank Abel Mabel Thomas. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Martin. Yes, sir. Um, first, I would like to thank the WCEG network for having us on and giving me the opportunity to speak about my platform. I'm gonna switch gears for a bit and not conclude like I normally would because I wanna speak candidly to everyone who's listening. Um, you know, while I've been canvassing, I've been, you know, hearing from people that are confused about this race and just confused about me and why I'm running. And so I wanna clear that up this evening. I believe that, you know, we are past due on progress. Within these panels, you often hear my opponents utter about their experiences and all the relationships they've galvanized during the 10 years of their career. However, I think it's important to note that the great Congressman Lewis had more experience than all of us and had more worldwide relationships than all of us. But yet, the problems of this nation has continued to persist, but more, more than anything, they have evolved. Um, with that being stated, this is why I've always been regarded as stating that we're on the brink of a political renaissance in which the people know that they deserve more and now the people are demanding that the government delivers them more. 
as a special needs educator, I've always believed and learned from my students and understanding that they deserve to inherit this nation uh, the best way that they deserve, the best way possible, the way they choose to inherit this nation. Um, this is why I created the People's Bailout, and this is why I think that it's important for us to live a legacy and leave a legacy that not only cherishes uh, civil rights, but the basic civil rights that we're looking for is just simply human rights. This is why I created the People's Bailout based on the dream of Martin Luther King um, in equity, economic equity, and social equity for all people. And if you would like to know more about this dream and how we're going to accomplish this dream, please log on to votethedream.com. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much. Mr. Hall. Yes, thank you so much for having me. I apologize for the technical difficulties, but I guess it's Murphy's Law. Uh, I'm Kwanzaa Hall, and I'm running for Congress to finish the unexpired term of Congressman John Lewis. And he was a neighbor and dear friend of me and my family. Uh, he and his late wife, Lillian Lewis, mentored me through high school, college, and throughout my 15 years as an elected official on Atlanta City Council and on the school board. Uh, so for me, serving the remainder of his term in Congress is not an opportunity to start building a political resume or to place a capstone on the end of my career. This is a personal obligation to continue the justice leadership in the 5th Congressional District, started by Ambassador Andrew Young and continued by Congressman John Lewis. I run to inspire the next generation of justice warriors, those who are coming behind me to make sure that the baton is really passed because there are a lot of folks in our community who want to hold that baton and never want to give it up. And we've got to pass the baton and inspire, lift up younger people, mentor them, give them a place so they can participate early on so they have the skill sets to be able to deliver on the promises that our great country holds. We'll win this election on September 29th if we have the support of all the voters who are listening today without a runoff. This race really demands that everyone sitting on the sidelines get in this race. We're all big people on this, on this panel, and it really won't hurt anyone's feelings if people take sides, because it's more important to not only our district, but to our nation, that we have someone elected in October who can go down there and fight in Washington, also who can fight here in Georgia. I'm Kwanzaa Hall, and I am the person that we need in this position. Look me up on my website, www.kwanzaahall.com. If you want to reach me via phone, 404-454-1116, and I'm on all platforms on social media at Kwanzaa Hall. I'm Kwanzaa Hall, and I need your support and your vote on September 29th. Thank you all for having us. Thank you very much, sir. Could I put it in my uh, website, www.ablemable.com? Sure. Could okay, you yeah. www.ablemable.com. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. I'd, I'd like to close out by, by just saying thank you. Thank you to all of you. I, I've listened to you personally. Uh, this is my second time. And all of you are, uh, as, as, as Ms. Waits uh, earlier said, said, a few days ago even, appear to be very qualified. Certainly all of you are knowledgeable. It seems as though your backgrounds have prepared you to take this next step. This is not just a ceremonial step. This is a very important step that not only, if not the world, definitely the whole country is waiting to see who steps into this very, very, very important position. So I, I thank all of you. Again, I want to thank all of you. I know it's been tedious at times. Some of the questions have been rather laborious, but you all gave great answers. And uh, the idea for WCEG is for our voters to make informed decisions. Informed decisions. I encourage everyone, everyone in the area, in the Congressional 5th District, to vote. Early voting starts September the 8th. The actual voting date is September 29th. So between September 8th and September 29th, you have no excuses. There are so many ways for you to vote. You can vote by mail. You can vote in person. There, there are no excuses. So get off your duff. Get out and vote. And we thank you. WCEG thanks you. You guys have been great. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Good night. Good night. Reminding you, this forum will be archived on YouTube for your uh, constituencies. Thank you. Thank you.